Biological Information Explaining Metabolic Innovation. We've been going through the book Biological Information, New Perspectives, uh, edited by a number of intelligent design people and Bruce Gordon, who is a self-organization advocate. Published by World Scientific Publishing in 2013. Uh, was originally supposed to be published by Springer, but they backed out of the deal. Uh, it was the proceedings of a symposium held in uh, 2011 at Cornell University. And uh, the book itself is available free on the internet um, in chapters. And um, it's, uh, it's also available in hardcover for a price that's somewhere over $100. Um, you're basically making a donation to the company. And those of you who have the interest and uh, have the money, I recommend that if for no other reason than to thumb your nose at the uh, Darwinian establishment. But uh, uh, we're going to go through, where we've been through most of this, the general introduction, information theory and biology, biological information and genetic theory, and theoretical and molecular biology, and then finally biological information and self-organizational complexity theory, which is what we'll cover next week. Uh, right now we're at the tail end of uh, theoretical molecular biology. The chapter we're going to be looking at is called Explaining Metabolic Innovation, Neo-Darwinism versus Design. It's by Douglas Axe and Ann Gager. Those of you who know, uh, they run the lab at the uh, Discovery Institute, which is a uh, biological institute, which is in Red Redmond, Washington, near Seattle. And the abstract uh, gives you a pretty good summary of what they're talking about. Like all life, bacterial life depends on a complex integrated network of, a precise, metabolic, of precise metabolic processes. These processes are carried out by more than a thousand enzymes, genetically encoded proteins with information-rich three-dimensional structures that catalyze specific chemical reactions. Can Neo-Darwinian neo theory explain the origin of this network of enzymes that orchestrates met metabolic complexity? Building on, excuse me, uh, building on previous experimental and theoretical work, we argue here that it cannot. But instead of merely listing the theory's shortcomings, we attempt to construct a full and coherent picture of how, long, how it has failed to explain metabolic innovation from the level of single enzymes all the way up to the level network of enzymatic pathways that composes meta metabolism as a whole. Then, from this critical synthesis, we identify six key, key principles of a new theory of biological innovation. Although these principles only hint at the substance of the new theory, they show clearly that it will be strikingly unlike neo-Darwinism. Whereas the old theory focuses on the simple material processes of mutation and selection in the hope that these can drive innovation, the new one focuses on innovation itself, on the concepts that guide effective design. Consequently, the new theory will look more like the systematic concepts of an engineering discipline than a set of causal laws. Introduction. Life exhibits extraordinary functional complexity on many scales, from the molecular to the organismal, and on up to the whole ecosystem systems. Near the bottom of this arrangement is metabolic complexity, which refers to the in intricate networks of coordinated chemical reactions that undergird all biological phenomena. Even the very simplest organisms, bacteria, are highly complex in this respect. It's universally its universality also makes it, that is, biological complexity, a benchmark for assessing theories of biological origins. That is, any theory claiming to explain the origin of biological complexity in general must tackle the particular challenge of explaining metabolic complexity. Again, what you see in yellow is mine, so I've omitted some and I have moved metabolic complexity where it makes sense in a sentence. This is a very difficult chapter to summarize rapidly. How well has the dominant theory neo-Darwinism met this challenge? The structure of metabolism itself suggests that this should be assessed in a hierarchical way. 
At the lower level, the question is how well the theory explains the origin of new functions for single enzymes. While at the higher level, it is how well it explains the origin of the more complex metabolic functions that emerge when enzyme functions are combined to form metabolic pathways and the integrated networks of pathways that constitute metabolism as a whole. Notice that natural selection relates more directly to the higher level in that this is where phenotypic traits are manifested, whereas mutation relates more directly to the lower level in that individual mutations typically alter single genes and therefore single enzymes. The perennial challenge for neo-Darwinism has been to explain how mutation and selection, two disparate phenomena operating at different levels, can combine to produce such spectacular functional innovations at both levels. The hope has always been that explaining evolutionary innovation at the level of single genes would eventually simplify the task of explaining innovation at the level of complete, uh, complete pathways. That reductionistic hope seems to be fading. Even at the level of single genes, explaining innovation is growing harder, not easier, as more and more distinct protein structures are discovered. The count of fundamentally distinct structures, or folds as they are known, now stands at about 2,000, with more being added every year. Now, the note says proteins have three-dimensional folded structures that determine their function. Those with secondary structural elements, and those of you who have taken biochemistry will recognize alpha helices and beta strands, in the same order and similar spatial arrangements uh, are said to have a common fold, or in other words, to be members of the same fold family. Proteins with fundamentally distinct folds differ in the arrangements of secondary structural elements and are in their order. The extraordinary difficulty that neo-Darwinism encounters with single gene innovations requires a new protein fold has recently been described in detail. That raises an obvious question. If the Darwinian mechanism cannot reliably explain innovation at the level of a single protein fold, what can it explain? This prompted us to investigate the more modest case of enzymatic innovation within a fold family, which we regard as metabolic innovation on the smallest scale possible. And uh, some of you may remember us discussing that particular paper, which we'll review briefly down below. Although adaptations can certainly occur on a smaller scale, innovation refers to the first time appearance of a genuinely new function, not the adjustment of an, an existing function. With that aim, we attempted to modify one particular bacterial enzyme so as to make it perform the function of another that closely resembles it. Although we were ultimately unable to achieve this functional conversion, extensive testing of the kinds of amino acid substitutions that ought to promote it demonstrated that success would, for our test case, require many more specific changes than the Darwinian mechanism can accomplish even over billions of years. It would be tempting to disregard that result if there were a body of contrary evidence, unique. Instead, as we have discussed, our result is just one contribution to a consistent picture based on numerous studies, and we'll talk about that later. No one denies the possibility of converting enzymes to new functions, but it seems that anyone attempting it with the assumption that it can be done with just a few nucleotide changes is in for a surprise. Where to go from here is a matter of perspective. Darwin's theory certainly will not benefit from ignoring or denying the severity of the problems that have beset it. Once that is dis conceded, the most important question is whether the theory needs to be remedied or replaced. Among the things that will be needed to answer that question is a full picture of what has gone wrong with the standard evolutionary account. So they're about to go there. In other words, it will be increasingly helpful to go beyond a mere catalog of inexplicable facts to something more like a synthesis of the whole problem. We use the word helpful here because a synthesis of this kind should, we think, be the start of something much more positive than dismantling of an old theory. It should instead be seen as an opportunity to gain key insights for constructing a new theory by building a clear understanding of how the old theory went wrong. 
that's what they're going to do. With that in mind, we here take a step towards such a synthesis by describing briefly the general aspects of metabolic innovation that most profoundly challenge the current neo-Darwinian model. The aspects are logically separable, which allows them to be examined as distinct topics. But their effects are highly interconnected. We show this by developing a synthesis of the whole problem in a progressive way as each aspect is considered. Based on this critical synthesis, we then offer the beginnings of a positive synthesis, a set of principles that hint at a new theory of innovation. The ultimate aim, of course, is to develop a theoretical framework, framework from which to understand all biological innovation. Metabolic innovation will admittedly be only a small part of the big picture, but its relative simplicity makes it a promising first part for getting the whole project underway. As should now be obvious, this paper is written primarily for readers who are willing to at least consider the possibility that Darwin's theory might be fundamentally deficient as an explanation for innovation in the history of life. We recognize that a great many talented biologists may not place themselves in that category. But we think the time is right for the evidential case against the standard Darwinian model to be presented in order to begin a serious discussion of the alternatives. Problem number one offsetting the cost of gene expression. The most widely accepted explanation for the origin of new enzymes is gene duplication and recruitment. This process involves duplication of an existing gene, followed by divergent evolution of one of the copies to a new function, where the other copy stays the same, more or less. For this process to work, though, the diverging duplicate must continue to be transcribed and translated. But these processes of gene expression carry a resource cost. Consequently, a duplicate gene undergoing divergent evolution will only confer a net benefit if that cost is more than offset by its positive biological contribution. If all you do is duplicate the gene and then dis disable it, then the organism would rather just get rid of it. That was made plain by Behe's paper earlier. In many cases, this makes cost reduction by deletion or inactivation of the duplicate gene much more likely than innovation as an adaptive response. Several recent papers have demonstrated this by finding that cells reduce expression of non-essential or duplicate genes or completely inactivate them in competitive environments. When under continuous selection for metabolic efficiency, such as when growing under nutrient-limiting conditions, Cells that reduce the total cost of gene expression by inactivating or deleting unneeded genes have a significant fitness advantage and can quickly overtake the population, in which case you can't further evolve that gene. In judging the degree to which the cost of gene expression impedes metabolic innovation, it is particularly important to distinguish natural selection from laboratory selection. Reported experimental conversions of two enzymes to O succinyl benzoate synthetase, synthase or OSBS activity illustrate this point, working with an E. coli strain in which the chromosomal gene encoding OSBS was deleted, Schmidt and co-workers identified single mutations that enabled two other genes to replace this missing function well enough for selection in vivo under specified laboratory conditions. However, among these conditions was high-level expression of the replacing gene, which was needed in order to com compensate for the very low activity of the converted function. So you make more of the enzyme. Uh, it's not as good, but, uh, but the product of the two finally gets up to where it's actually worthwhile. Even with the boosted expression, though, the converted genes fell well short of fully restoring growth. So while the enzyme conversions reported in that study provided useful information, it should not be assumed that they would succeed in nature, or as they would say, in the wild. Uh, considering that newly evolved functions are likely to be extremely weak, it should be expected that they would need amplified expression in order to be of any use. But if so, the expression cost might easily outweigh any functional benefit. And therefore, these would be deselected rather than selected. Natural genes, of course, escape this dilemma by having extremely high catalytic proficiencies and by minimizing expression costs through regulated expression, that is, turning expression off when it is not needed. 
We've got lots of tryptophan in the environment. Don't use those tryptophan genes. First obstacle, because gene expression is costly, it cannot be assumed that weakly converted enzyme functions isolated by laboratory selection would provide net selective benefit in wild populations. Problem two, winning the fixation lottery. Bacteria reproduce rapidly enough to exhaust any pool of nutrients, no matter how large, in a short time frame. This means that local extinction by starvation figures much more prominently in the dynamics of bacterial populations than it does for higher organisms. That is to say, most bacteria die without leaving any descendants. That's, of course, my summary of the next part. This means a dramatic increase in time required for rare genotypic variants to become fixed. That is, to become the new wild type. In population genetics, a parameter that if, uh, characterizes this phenomenon is the effective population size NE. Roughly speaking, NE is the size of the subpopulation in each generation that will influence the genetic makeup of future generations. So the smaller NE is relative to the true population size N. The more rare winners are in the propagation lottery. The estimated value of NE for wild bacterial populations is 10 to the ninth, roughly 11 orders of magnitude lower than the estimates of N which is 10 to the 20th. Uh, consequently, particular beneficial mutations have to appear in the order of 10 to the 11th times before they have any reasonable likelihood of being fixed. And if you throw in some other factors, something like 10 to the 12th more or more appearances may be needed in order to make fixation to become probable. In a population of 10 to the 20th organisms that passes through 10 to the third generations per year, which is kind of a reasonable estimate. This does not prevent fixation of common mutations. A beneficial mutation that occurs once in 10 to the 9th cells, for example, will appear 10 to the 11th times per generation, which means that a cell line destined to carry this mutation to fixation will probably be present within roughly 10 generations. But the situation changes for rare mutations or rare combinations of mutations. At an incidence rate of one new carrier in the population per generation, some 12 to 10 to the 12th generations, or in this hypothetical situation, 10 to the 9th or a billion years, would be required for fixation to become likely, even though the genotype in question exists somewhere in the population most of the time. The second obstacle, then, is that beneficial mutations appearing less than about once per generation in a global bacterial population may remain unfixed for a billion years or more. Problem three, complex adaptation, combining rare genetic events. From here on, it will become increasingly apparent that each of the problems we described is compounded by the others. If new enzyme functions can evolve by consecutive adaptive mutations, each known to be to occur spontaneously with reasonable frequency, then problem two would be of no consequence. The difficulty arises from the fact that they typically appear not to be achievable in this way. If you understand evolutionary theory, it is that each advance is selected for. Theory doesn't necessarily uh, correspond to reality. When we attempted to convert an enzyme to perform a new function, we found it to be surprisingly difficult. The starting point was an enzyme we designated KBL2, and the target function was that of BioF2, synthesis of biotin. The structures of KBL2 and BioF2 are so similar that the enzymes are commonly assumed to be close evolutionary relatives. The shortest path when they did the experiments was uh, would involve seven or more mutations. The true number is probably much higher, but even seven is high enough to cause a severe problem. Even this seemingly modest number of mutations places the conversion well beyond what neo-Darwinian evolution can explain. And they have a figure and uh, uh, some references to back that up. 
There is an understandable tendency for defenders of a theory when faced with challenging evidence like this to marshal as much opposing evidence as can be found. Indeed, if there were a solid body of evidence showing that genuine conversion of enzyme functions usually are achievable with one or two nucleotide substitutions, we would conclude that the case we examined happened to be exceptionally problematic. But the results of our study is actually quite consistent with the whole body of work on functional conversions in enzymes. They're going to quote two people, or two sets of people. John Gerlt and Patricia Babbitt uh, gave this assessment. Interchanging reactions catalyzed by members of mechanistically, mechanistically diverse superfamilies might be envisioned as easy ex exercises in redesign. If nature does it, why can't we? And some people will argue that way, it can't be that hard. Because it happened. Anecdotally, many attempts at interchanging activities in mechanistically diverse superfamilies have since been attempted, but few successes have been realized. Similarly, Philip Romero and Francis Arnold drew the conclusion that many researchers have reached. Some functions, however, simply cannot be reached through a series of small uphill steps. Remember, that's standard evolutionary theory and instead require longer jumps that include mutations that would be neutral or even deleterious when made individually. Examples of functions that might require multiple simultaneous mutations include the appearance of a new catalytic activity. So uh, Axis and Gager's uh, research having to fit right in with everybody else's findings. Apart from neo-Darwinian expe expectations, perhaps the difficulty of enzyme conversion should not have been a surprise. Converting an enzyme to a new catalytic activity is therefore likely re to require this, the simultaneous reconfiguration of many amino acid interactions so that any stepwise process of enzymatic conversion almost inevitably will involve non-functional intermediates. Therefore, of course, refers to stuff that I've omitted. In the end, two things seem inescapable. One is that enzyme, enzymatic innovations requiring more than two specific mutations in a spare gene provided by a duplication event are implausible in neo-Darwinian terms. The other is that once this lim limitation is taken into account, most reported experimental conversions of enzyme functions are beyond the reach of neo-Darwinian processes under natural conditions. So the third obstacle is that adaptations requiring duplication and modification of an existing gene should not be presumed feasible if they require more than two specific base substitutions, which seems to exclude most fun functional conversions. Problem four, the complexity of metabolic pathways. The severe challenge to the Darwinian model posed by the first three problems becomes exponentially more severe when we recognize that the relevant scale of genuine innovation is not a single new enzyme function, but rather the coordinated sequence of enzymatic steps needed to produce a new phenotypic trait. Our reported attempt to change KBL2 into a bioF2-like enzyme in E. coli illustrates this exact point. To make selection of successful mutants possible, one of us engineered a strain that lacks the gene encoding BioF2. Without that gene, the engineered strain is unable to make biotin, an essential cofactor for fatty acid biosynthesis and other carboxylation reactions. In other words, it can't produce membrane uh, constituents. This makes growth impossible unless either functional conversion is achieved, which never happened, or biotin is supplied as a nutrient, which is how we maintain the strain. This suited our experimental objective wa objectives well, but our engineered strain is wholly unrealistic as a natural evolutionary context for the origin of BioF2. If you turned this thing loose in the wild, it would die out. The complete metabolic pathway for biotin synthesis shows why this is so. BioF2 is just one of four enzymes that are exclusively dedicated to biotin production. 
This means that any proposed explanation of the origin of biotin production must account for innovation on a considerably larger scale than a single functional conversion. Quadrupling the scale of a complex adaptation increases the evolutionary difficulty not merely by a factor of four, but by, rather by a power of four. And depending on how you're counting it, it may decrease it by even more than that. And here's the bio, the, you start out with pimel oil CoA and L-alanine, and you go through BioF2, which is the one that they were working on. And then you also need BioA2, BioD2, and BioB2 before you get to biotin. And that's the point. You not only have to fix this one, but you have to fix all the other ones at the same time. If you don't fix them at the same time, it doesn't matter. You don't get biotin. The biotin example illustrates the problem of pathway complexity nicely, but is it typical or exceptional for the metabolic pathways to depend on four dedicated enzymes that don't do anything else? The biotin pathway is unexceptional in its complexity. According to E. coli, E. coli uses 1,467 enzymes to carry out the function of 281 metabolic pathways. If you divide that in, and you come out to five enzymes per pathway, a little over on the average. Similarly, in 2001, Teichmann et al. reported 581 proteins used in 106 small-scale metabolic pathways in E. coli. These figures give us at least a rough picture of the complexity of metabolic processes in terms of enzymatic steps. In other words, biotin is actually low lower than the average, at least the uh, mean. Most of the innovations that brought new metabolic traits did indeed involve multiple enzymatic innovations. This poses a severe challenge to neo-Darwinism. Mechanisms that have been proposed in attempts to meet this challenge, such as retrograde evolution or serial duplication and recruitment, do not match the actual distribution of protein domains across and within pathways. Rather, most pathways employ several different protein folds, which, as we discuss next, raises another problem. Sorry. Fourth obstacle, accounts of metabolic innovation must recognize that beneficial mut metabolic traits typically depend on multiple dedicated enzymes. Problem five, radical, radical innovation, the need for new protein folds. A realistic treatment of metabolic innovation has to explain more than a single new enzyme function. Explaining how a new enzyme function might appear is not the whole problem for several reasons. The first, we just discussed, uh, you have a whole bunch of enzymes that you need to get to one product. The second is that for these new functions, the, the, these new functions often call for new protein folds. The problem of converting an existing fold to a new function is very modest compared to the problem of generating a stable new fold with enzyme, enzymatic activity from scratch. The one rearrange a few things, the other one you have to completely rearrange the protein. The basis for thinking that such structural innovation is typically beyond the reach of Darwinian evolution has been described in the first paper they cited. The next question is how prevalent structural innovation appears to have been in the early history of life. We can get at least a rough answer to this in a couple of different ways. One is to estimate the number of distinct fold types used by a typical bacterial species and divide that by the number of metabolic pathways that these folds serve. This gives us an average number of new folds that have to be explained per pathway explanation. A previous analysis found this average to be about four, that is 991 distinct folds serving 263 pathways, which means that the vast majority of early metabolic pathways require new folds. A complementary approach is to get a rough lower bound estimate of the total number of distinct protein folds used in bacterial life. Analysis of the bacterial genomes that have been sequenced so far indicate that a substantial majority, that is over 80%, of the 1,962 known protein folds are used in at least one bacterial species. That result suggests that bacterial life uses most of them, that is, the folds. Currently, about 40% of the proteins known to exist are 
known only by the sequence of their encoding gene. That is, nothing is known of their structure or function. As more genomes are sequenced, the list of these uncharacterized proteins continues to grow. And again, in this, a substantial pr fraction of them, about 50 percent, are of bacterial origin. A concerted effort has been made in recent years to target these proteins for structural analysis with interesting results. Of 248 newly determined structures described by Jaroszewski et al., 44 are completely new folds, and another 23 have only partial similarity to the known folds. Thus, the folds that have been identified so far may be only the tip of a very large iceberg. The fifth obstacle, accounts of metabolic innovation must recognize that they often depend on new protein folds. Causal circularity, problem six. Kuhn, uh, Papp, and uh, Smith Murray have described the problem of kickstarting metabolic networks. Their abstract begins, if chemical A is necessary for the synthesis of more chemical A, then A has the power of replication. That's a positive way of putting it, I guess. Accordingly, they apply the term autocatalytic to A. To avoid confusion, we suggest that this term ought to be reserved for cases where A is sufficient for the product, uh, production of itself, with no extraordinarily, extraordinary preconditions. I suppose sort of like prion protein. By contrast, A being necessary for making A does not mean that supplies of A are self-renewing. Rather, it means that the absence of A assures its continued absence. We will use the term causal secularity to re describe this case. Whenever a biosynthetic process exhibits causal circularity, requiring its product, A, selection-based accounts of the origin of this process encounter complications. In the first place, since the biosynthesis of A as we now see it requires not just the genes encoding the enzymes that produce A, but also A itself, a satisfactory origin has to go beyond gene origins. The current biosynthetic apparatus for making A must, in such a case, not only come into existence, but also be primed with pre-existing A in order to begin working. But this presents another complication. If A was pre-existing, how would acquiring a way to making A produce a selective advantage? Although it's possible cons to construct answers to this, they all suppose circumstances beyond the simple fact that A is useful which makes the final explanation only as compelling as those suppositions are. How common is causal circularity, though? By analyzing metabolic network models for various microbial species, Kuhn and co-workers showed that ATP production involves causal circularity in all organisms. You've got to have ATP in order to produce more of it. With other metabolites showing circularity in some organisms, but not in others. However, they may have underestimated the generality of this phenomenon. A few examples will illustrate this. One is the biosynthesis of cysteine in bacteria. The reactant that provides the sulfur atom for incorporation into cysteine is hydrogen sulfide, which is itself must be produced from sulfate in a 24-step enzymatic process. That's right, it takes 24 steps to make that work. The final step of this process is catalyzed by sulfite reductase, an enzyme that depends upon a prosthetic group consisting of four iron atoms bridged by four in inorganic sulfur atoms, an FES4, FE4S4 iron sulfur cluster, basically pyrite, if you like, and coordinated to the protein by means of four cysteine side chains. The FE4S4, of course, has to itself be made or scavenged from somewhere. Consequently, without those coordinating cysteine residues, sulfite reductase cannot produce hydrogen sulfide. And without hydrogen sulfide, cysteine synthesase cannot produce cysteine. So cysteine biosynthesis is a striking example of causal circularity. Other amino acids 
pathways provide additional examples. The biosynthesis of arginine depends on ornithine carbamoyl transferase, which has an essential arginine residue in its active site. And the biosynthesis of lysine depends on diaminopimylate decarboxylate, which requires a lysine residue. So if you don't have any lysine, you're not going to make the enzyme that produces lysine. In fact, there's a simple way to generalize the principle of causal circularity. Since life is a prerequisite for all biosynthesis, any biosynthetic product that is necessary for life in its present form is also necessary for its own biosynthesis in modern life. So causal circularity exists for all essential biosynthetic products. In some cases, the loop is extremely tight. Lysine A, for example, embodies the causal loop in itself by both producing and requiring lysine directly. More often, the causal loop involves multiple activities. That's actually part of the same paragraph, and I didn't mark it that way. Bio biotin production is a good example of this, biotin being necessary for fatty acid biosynthesis, which is necessary for building the cell membrane, which is necessary for life, which is necessary for the biosynthesis of everything, including biotin. So in order to conceive of an evolutionary origin of biotin biosynthesis, we must suppose that prior to this origin either, A, cells were making their membranes without biotin, or B, cells had an abiotic source of biotin, which is kind of crazy if you look at the molecule. Either way, the question of how the ability to make biotin would have been beneficial is raised. To answer it, we have to contrive a selective scenario that goes well beyond plain facts, which means we have to justify both a contrived selection story and a seemingly unlikely supposition, either A or B, about the state of life prior to biotin biosynthesis. The sixth ob obstacle, then, is the fact that life depends on numerous components jointly, means that no simple relation exists between the functions of these components and the selective story that would be needed for them to have arisen as simple adaptations. And their discussion, neo-Darwinism, the theory is unraveling. All theories encounter unsolved problems, but for a solid theory, these are challenges in the positive sense of the word, opportunities to prove, to prove itself further. For example, what happened with gravitation and the existence of Neptune. With neo-Darwinism, as we learn more about the biological systems, we encounter apparently insoluble problems at every level. It's getting worse with time. To make matters worse, as we've seen here, the interdependence of these individual failures compounds them greatly, making repair of the theory seem very unlikely. As negative as this may sound, it has a positive side. The insights we gain from identifying the obstacles facing neo-Darwinism can and should inform the construction of a new theory to take its place. We ourselves have become convinced that intelligent causation is essential as a starting point for any successful theory of biological innovation. We have attempted to identify design principles from each of the problems described above. The six principles paired with the obstacles they address are as follows. The first obstacle you remember is that because gene expression is costly, it should not be assumed that weakly converted enzyme functions isolated by laboratory selection would provide net selective benefit in a wild population. That means that innovations are more likely investments than quick cash. They must be well implemented to offset their cost, and even then the benefits tend to accrue over a long period. The second obstacle, beneficial mutations appearing less than about once per generation in a global bacterial population may remain unfixed for a billion years or more, means that for innovation to be established reliably, they need to be carried past a critical tipping point in numerical representation, beyond which they become self-establishing. The third obstacle, adaptations requiring duplications and modification of an existing gene should not be presumed feasible if they require more than two specific base substitutions, which seems to exclude most functional conversions, means that the substantial reworking of a homologous structure needed to get it to give it a genuinely new function is more suggestive of reapplication of a concept than adjustment of a physical thing. The fourth obstacle, 
accounts of metabolic innovation must recognize that beneficial metabolic traits typically depend on multiple ged dedicated genes, means that useful innovations tend to require the simultaneous solution of multiple new problems, which means they tend to be compound innovations. And probably you could say complex as well. The fifth obstacle, account of metabolic innovations must recognize that they often depend on new protein folds, means that useful innovations often involve both the reapplication of proven design concepts and the de, de novo invention of new ones, somewhat like the fourth principle. And the sixth obstacle, the fact that life depends on numerous components jointly, means that no simple relationship exists between the functions of these components and the selective story that would be needed for them to have arisen as simple adaptations. That means that the, implica the in implementation of innovation is nearly the opposite of normal physical causation. It is top-down arrangement of matter in such a way that the resulting bottom-up behavior of that matter serves the intended purpose of the innovator. Biological innovation seems similar in essence to human innovation, though certainly beyond it in degree. This realization is attracting, uh, attracting an increasing number of engineers to biology with the aim of reapplying biological innovations in human technology. Although that field of study, known as biomimetics, has practical ambitions, the fact that it exists and is thriving also implies an essential similarity between intelligent design and engineering and intelligent design in life. Skipping over a paragraph, next and perhaps most significantly, it is clear that this new theory will be of an entirely different kind than the one it hopes to replace. Darwinism is purely mechanistic in its reproach and reductionistic. The design theory hinted at in this paper will be fundamentally top-down in its approach and therefore fundamentally non-reductionistic. It will focus mainly on design principles rather than on mechanisms. Students of the new theory will focus mainly on the principles that inform biological designs rather than on the processes by which these designs may be implemented. So somebody says, well, where's your mechanism? Well, that's not the focus. Sidney Brenner, one of the pioneers of modern molecular biology, talks about systems biology and his suggestion that we should return to the hardcore reductionism uh, in their opinion, also misses the mark. Our approach directly reflects the structure of biological systems, and as we reduce each level to the level below, organisms to cells and cells to molecules, we can then confidently complete the reductionist program because the properties of molecules can be reduced to physics. However, the problem with this approach is that reducing a living thing to its simplest material causes does not lead to an understanding of it. By way of analogy, and I think this is a really good analogy, those who want to understand software should have some exposure to the zeros and ones of machine language, but they would do well to spend most of their time studying principles of software design that are nowhere to be found among the bits. In the end, Brenner's search for a new theory seems to be hamstrung by the old theory. He thinks we need to remember that whereas mathematics is the art of the perfect and physics is the art of the optimal, Biology, because of evolution, is only the art of the satisfactory. And uh, Gager and Axe say, we think it may actually be much more than that. Now, I would kind of make my own comment on that, and that is that uh, uh, maybe because of devolution, biology is only the art of the satisfactory. At one time, it was the art of the optimal. Now my own take, I think this paper is one of the richest in the book in terms of giving you information that, that's not easily available. Uh, it's very hard to compress. Neo-Darwinism cannot account for most new enzyme functions, let alone enzyme structure or biochemical pathways and the problem of circularity, uh, which goes all the way up to the organism level, the cell level. The problem of the origin of life, given this information, is even more difficult than it was before. And one of the things I appreciate is that the paper is data-driven. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn.
Yes. Uh, I had a question near the beginning when you're discussing folds. Um, it said they couldn't create a mechanism for uh, making even one fold, and so they have to have maybe an average of three or four folds. Uh, what are the functions of the folds? Are, are this merely observational that there is a certain number associated with certain things and more of them with other things? Or do, uh, is it um, just uh, happenstance or does it actually contribute to function? Well, um, in order for an enzyme to work, it has to catch, let, let's say it's trying to join two, uh, two molecules. It's going to have to catch the one molecule in a particular spot. It's going to have to catch the other molecule in a particular spot. It's going to have to have uh, what they call an active site that will tweak the, uh, the bonds between them in such a way as to make it easy to get over the energetic hump. Um, in order to do that, you have to have a molecule that has those particular shapes to it that will catch the molecule, so to speak. Um, and the shape is not just actual physical shape, but it's also electrical shape. Uh, in order to do that, the, the, the enzyme has to have its own specific shape. Sometimes its own ability to change its shape slightly. And in order to do that, you have to have the rest of the structure. So that whole thing, uh, you know, it can allow at the tail end perhaps one or two changes. Doesn't matter. Um, maybe somewhere on the back of the molecule it won't matter. But on the particular sites, everything has to be exact. And the rest of it has to be compatible with its being able to fold into a position to where it will hold those molecules together. Uh, and that's the, the function of those folds, as they're called, is basically to provide some kind of structural stability to the enzyme itself. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, Ariel, can you pass the mic back? Thanks. So since it's been a few years since I studied this, the are we saying that the same amino acid sequence can take different structural shapes based on outside influences on the on that amino acid sequence? Back back in the years ago, it was like here's the, the the primary structure; it automatically goes into a secondary and automatically goes into a tertiary structure. And when they're talking about different folds, are we saying that the same enzyme can take on different folds depending on outside? influences on that amino acid sequence? I don't know of an example of what you're talking about. I, I won't say it isn't possible. If we had a biochemist, they might be able to comment more on it, you know, uh, precisely. But um, as far as I know, there are no enzymes that if you fold them up one way will, um, let's say, um, uh, decarboxylate uh, uh, alanine, and then if you fold them the other way, they will uh, add something to a fatty acid. As far as I know, that's not the case. Uh, there are, well, the, I guess there is hexokinase, which will split uh, dimers of, of a number of different sugars, and that's why it's called hexokinase instead of glucokinase. No. Correction, it, it doesn't split them. It, it adds, I think it adds phosphate to them. But it, whatever does it, uh, it, it does it in general rather than, uh, rather than one specific. Uh, uh, there is actually glucokinase that does the same thing, only, but o it will only take glucose, whereas the other one is kind of a more general uh, enzyme. But but to my, that doesn't refold to do that. It's the same, the same well, general enzyme. I'm trying to follow there, saying that you have to have new folds, and if the new fo if all folds are based on the primary sequence, and you change the primary sequence, why are we saying that they, in addition to the mutation, they have to have a fold change also? If the fold change is based on the primary sequence. Well, that's th there's there's one sense in which you're right. 
in that if you change this primary sequence and you count the chaperone proteins that helped them to fold, uh, that you've done the job. But in another sense, in order to get the new fold, you have to change multiple amino acids. So it's not just a matter of one or two changes. See, the thing you have to remember is that the Darwinian model has you changing one base at a time. Or perhaps <laughs> duplicating an enzyme and then changing one base at a time. So their argument is, is the fact that you have to change multiple bases in order to get a new fold, as opposed to dealing with any of the other aspects that make the folds, as in where's the rest of the enzymes, the rest of the environment that affects the eventual shape of that enzyme. He's dealing with the fact that you have to have multiple enzyme or multiple sequence changes, right? Right. When, when it, that's what he means when you have to have new folds, is you had to have multiple changes in the original primary sequence. Exactly. And see, the, the point of it is that evolutionary theory has always been, well, if you change this one and it's a little better, and change this one and it's a little better, and change this one is a little better. The problem is not that we don't understand evolutionary theory as is sometimes charged. The problem is that we understand that life is not like evolutionary theory. That there are very few pathways. I don't know that I would say none whatsoever but there are very few pathways where you can show that if you change this base here, you get a little better, and you change this base here, and you get a little better, and then you change the next one, you get a little better, and then change the next one, you get a little better, and pretty soon you've gone all the way from um, a nondescript uh, clump of protein or perhaps a protein that used to do some of their func function to now a protein that will produce the first step for biotin synthesis. It takes well, biologic it, systems eliminate those ineffective middle ones. Anyway, exactly. Right? Exactly. They're extra protein that has to be supported somehow. And have they shown that the additional influences from the environment, whether they be other enzymes, et cetera, that are required to create the exact fold that you need, are also inhibited by those one and two changes along the way, further compounding the probabilities? Actually, to be fair, in the biotin synthesis you aren't even changing the folds. You're just trying to change a little bit of the active site. In other words, it's one that is almost the same shape. Whereas now, if you have to have a whole new alpha coil in this spot, you're going to have to create you know, maybe 10 or 12 amino acids or something like that that, that all have just the right uh, properties to allow the alpha coil to, to form. And the folds are just a more complex, more difficult part of changing uh, one enzyme to another. But what it's saying is that this particular part of the enzyme has to be changed more or less all at once. Because if you don't do it all at once, you wind up with a protein that won't fold properly, that won't do its job properly, and that therefore is so much excess baggage and if there's a, if there's a um, deletion mutation or a mutation that makes this thing stop being produced, let's say you take the initial methionine and you know, wipe it out, that what happens is that you now no longer produce all that extra protein that you didn't need. And the bacteria goes, uh, gets along faster because it's not wasting time producing non non-useful uh, protein. So the loss of function will hit you far more rapidly than the gain of function. Well, it, if you do get a gain of function, it's wonderful because now you can live without having to have biotin somewhere else. That is, if you have the other three enzymes waiting to go. But that's, that's the problem. You, you not only have one enzyme, but you have the next enzyme and the next enzyme and the next enzyme, and you have to evolve all four of them together in the same bacterium before you get any benefit. And now you're wasting four times as much protein. So really, we, we're back to the same obvious versus the inobvious, that life is so complex that it, it 
it is obvious to most people that it can't happen. And so what we do is we keep coming at this same topic in multiple different directions to prove in every element of scientific endeavor that the complexity cannot support itself in a, in a sequential uh, step by fashion. And I don't care which way we go at it, it seems like we come back to the same obvious step that you can't get this complexity by random chance and single changes. I mean, we just That's go at it from different and different points of view, but yeah. it still comes back to the same problem that you, it, life is just far too complex and interdependent for single steps to make it happen. That's basically correct. Uh, the one thing I would say is it's complex and specified. That is to say, these things have to work. It's not enough for them to just be out there. And in fact, if they're just out there but not working, the cell is ahead to just cut off that whole thing. And the best thing to do is just take out the DNA. And then you don't have to make DNA, you don't have to make RNA, you don't have to make protein, and uh, you're home free. Uh, except, of course, that you can't live without biotin. This is really a, an excellent chapter. I, I'm very impressed with it, and it puts together what we suspected right along, you know, they would, but they just really, really uh, lays it out very nicely. I, I just w would comment uh, this, that they, they're dealing here with very simple organisms, and some of their figures based on, you know, rapid rates of reproduction and so on. Uh, but when we look at nature, the picture is much more complex than what they're dealing with here. Uh, you know, our genome is probably you know, a thousand times longer than uh, that of uh, E. coli, for instance. And, and we, instead of, instead of three times a day reproducing, we're, we're doing more like uh, one every 20 years. Exactly. We were, they had very rapid rates of reproduction, and we have very slow rates of reproduction. And it's not just uh, us, uh, it's uh, most advanced organisms and extremely long, longer genomes than we have, of course, in plants, certain plants, and so on. Uh, so adding to this is, is you know, a fact that, man, uh, just look at nature about you, and you, you're, you're faced with just a, a total impossibility. I, you can't use that word, actually. There's always a probability it could happen, but then, uh, but uh, any reasonable <laughs> probability that it would happen, it, it just uh, gets untenable to, to try to think that. Uh, well, it gets to the kind of thing, you know, where you're winning the lottery every day in a row for. 30 years, and at that point you're beginning to say, this, it's, it's got to be yeah. fixed. There, there's no way that happens originally. Here's the other thing, and maybe this will make the point that, uh, that they're trying to make better, and that is that they are not arguing because, well, this is the theoretical probability. They've actually gone in and changed some of the enzymes to try to find out whether they have proper um, uh, catalytic activity or not. Try to see how many changes do you have to go from the closest enzyme we know to this particular enzyme to get to it. And the answer is it's not going to happen. It's like seven mutations has to be the minimum. And it may be more than that. And and they're doing that after having gone into the laboratory and doing seven mutations and so forth. And see, that's, that's the key to this whole thing. It's not just a matter of, well, they don't think. They've actually gone in and experimented and found how many changes you have to make. Precise changes. Precise changes. We can say that we changed this uh, DNA base, which changes this RNA base, which changes this protein residue, and you need an absolute minimum of seven of them to get from point A to point B. Yeah. 
Yes, which are, I, I mean, uh, again, this is putting not just, I think it's difficult. This is saying we tried it in the laboratory and it is really difficult. And to me, that, that kind of thing is really important when you're dealing with um, um, with this kind of an argument where, where people would like to assume that, well, ev evolution can't be that hard. I mean, after all, it happened. Well, no, it is that hard. And it happened, and it suggests that evolution maybe wasn't the motive power. And the obvious motive power is something that can look at it and say, this is where I want to be, fix it all up, and then have it, have it be that way. That is to say, intelligent design. You know, it's, uh, you know, we talk about faith and uh, science type of thing. Uh, this completely reverses the equation. <clears throat> It takes so much more faith to believe in evolution than it does in creation. That the people of faith are the evolutionists. We, we're the scientists. Yeah, at least to the point of intelligent design. The age question comes up in a different context, but I would maintain that once you get to the intelligent design, then knowing what happened way back when, it's more important to know the designer than it is to know what nature can do all by itself. Well, you, you have to open the door there. Once you open that door. The divine foot comes in and everything mm -hmm. else follows, and, uh, <laughs> which is, of course, precisely where some people don't want it to go. Now, the, their example here, it's the same as uh, they use in that chapter of that book uh, that we discussed earlier of uh, Axe and Gouger. Isn't it? Isn't it the... Uh, yeah, uh, the seven. The seven. Uh, seemed to me that chapter talked about the limit of seven. Um, uh, actually, I think that's in a different paper. I think it's in the paper they cite. I may be wrong. Let me just scan that real quickly. Um, <coughs> I think this is the only one that they've actually written. Uh, oh, I'm yeah. Sure. That, I think this is. No, I'm that is correct. There, there. It's a different paper that they presented all that other stuff in. No, it's and they cite it. It's another book. It's another book. Yes. Or Information. I don't. Know, I don't remember the title. Yeah. I've got the book. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're citing their previous work, but the point of it is that they the the previous work is the kind of work that needs to be done. Exactly. Case well, case closed. Um, we've been here for a little over an hour, so I suppose that this is a good place to close. Come back uh, next week and we'll talk about self-organizational theory and you'll get a feel for how it differs from intelligent design and also how it differs from uh, neo-Darwinism. And we may even be able to see whether and how it differs from truth. But we will see. <laughs>